We are recording. And uh, for those who are watching the recording, this is the w WTC Web RTC Working Group meeting at TPAC September 20, 2014, 2020, September 10th, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, going on. Later today, we had the joint meeting of this group with the uh, Screen Capture Community Group. Wednesday is uh, the fun day at TPAC, where you want to be five people. But we have a few things uh, shoved into one track. One is uh, RTP transport which is a new proposal for, well, uh, making RTP if more directly available to JavaScript, evolved video, video encoding with web codecs, sync on the web. I mean, if you want to make things happen at the same time, then it's a good idea to have an idea, an idea of what the time is and what you and how you ref, reference, reference uh, what time is. That can be complicated. And on Thursday, we have the joint meeting with the media working group. Lots of things on the discussion. We'll uh, try to keep to the timing so that uh, we shut down items when they run out of time. Hopefully, that will be when we have an idea of a conclusion. But if not, we'll just continue the discussion online and in the next meeting and on GitHub, of course. So we're using the WebRTC uh, channel on IRC for, for the speaker queue and use plus Q and minus Q to in the in the channel, base hand and lower hand is what you what you do when they're we're on the completely virtual meeting. So you can join Zoom using a browser, like I am, and, and then you're actually using web codecs and web RTC data channels at least part of the time. Please wait for microphone. To be granted, no, that's not right. I don't think, I think we have that, but anyway, state your full name when you speak because not everyone is going to recognize you from your name, and sometimes your face is visible and sometimes it's not. Okay, any questions so far? That was the standard speech, and I know I have, and I am exactly on time. And I'll talk about the state of the working group. The scary thing about the state of the working group is that I started these slides by taking the slides from one year ago and saying, okay, this was the state one year ago and what's changed? Hmm. Too little. There was a lot of stuff that was exactly the same. I mean, uh, Still the dominant web art, uh, browser uh, video conferencing platform. And with these chunks of the non-browser market, everyone uses LibRTC. <coughs> lib, lib, uh, web RTC, more or less. And it's used in many applications all, all over the place. Web codecs over web transport, media over quick, which is no longer about uh, especially about quick or media, it's about uh, distributing uh, uh, distributing video in a cacheable fashion. And uh, Zoom has actually deployed web codecs over web transport, so someone's trying it. And interoperability is uh, mostly that you can run the same app on multiple browsers. There's very few cases where you can use 
uh, one video conferencing system to call another video conferencing system. Given that your people fire up, uh, people don't need to install anything. Just if they they just fire up a different web page, that might not be a problem, but it's, it's not what we expected when we started this thing. Since TPAC twenty twenty three, Media Capture Main is still getting ready for REC, removing uh, non implemented features and. Uh, Trying to actually clarify what the what the what the what the, the things that are specified mean and how to test them. We got media capture extensions that is a holding pen for new ideas. WebRTC PC has actually started merging some things from the extensions. We we have the rule that if you have one merge and one one browser that is promising to, to implement. Uh, one implementation and one browser that is promising to implement, we can move this back because we expect it to be have sufficient backing to end up in REC eventually. We about to see stats is uh, still uh, still uh, behaving like a living standard, but uh, much calmer down now than a year ago. Encode and meet encode the transform was an interesting case where. We actually added a couple of new features, and that those features were useful mm -hmm. to build a new products in functionality that didn't work before. That's kind of what we want to see happen is a success. There's been lots of implementation activity. Features implemented in multiple browsers. I looked at the, at the number of tests for WebRTC. <laughs> And a year ago, we had about 1,200 tests. Now we have more than 2,000. And the number of passing tests has grown quite a bit too, which is part of what we have uh, been working for because we tried to make a strict policy that if you want to land something in uh, WebRTC PC, you must have a test for it. Or... Uh, we look at we look at you strangely, but uh, sometimes mark them un as untestable. That's life. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't seem to be changing much. Media capture transform, media capture record, from element image priority. Priority has actually been specified for about ten years, mm -hmm. but not implemented anywhere in anything. But now we now we have the first implementation that actually does something with priority. It's SNTP inside WebRTC, uh, libwebRTC, uh, and it's still behind the flag in Chrome. But you can use it, and it actually has an effect on scheduling. So that's uh, a wonderful thing to see. Ideas that we've thought were, was, were obviously needed ten years ago finally getting implemented by someone, and then we'll see if anyone uses it. We managed to live without it for a while. Major new expanded top topics, we're about to see encoded transform, new functionality. We got the encoded source presentation later. We're about to see eyes. So you have a, the, the slow progress of getting the pieces in so that we can control eyes from web, from from JavaScript, platform processing, uh, and lots of lots of things can be done in multiple places. Like you can do them in a browser, you can do them in the the camera driver, or you can do them in the data center. So we're trying to make some story that hangs together and actually gives people a consistent. <coughs> set of uh, controls to make these things behave and doing things like if you have blurred the background, perhaps you shouldn't blur it again. And we've got screen, screen capture, which is active, but largely SSCG. <laughs> so that was a quick state of uh, what we're working on and why, I think. And I'll open that floor to discussion. 
Right. That means that I have to look at the see if there are queue. Yaniva, okay. Okay, Yaniva. And uh, uh, Yaniva, uh, co chair from Mozilla. Um, thanks, Harold. I just wanted to highlight some of uh, the implementation progress. Uh, Firefox 132 is now shipping with the more, it's in nightly right now, but uh, released to ship with more private and remote devices, which I think is important to get Media Capture Main to rec. Uh, there's been other progress in WebRTC and Coda Transform with implementations in Safari and uh, Firefox, and as well as in Media Capture Transform with uh, an implementation in Safari. So uh, I think better, more implementations uh, is definitely an improvement and gets us to uh, to rec uh, faster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, speaker queue is empty. Then we're ahead of schedule. And Dom can certainly use the time. Oh, yes, hi. Uh, Dominica and Mathieu, staff contact for the group. Um, so as uh, have <clears throat> presented, uh, there has been some, uh, I think, interesting progress in bringing a date to the WebRTC recommendation, as you may recall, uh, some uh, it's more than three years ago, we released uh, WebRTC as a uh, WCC recommendation along with the IETF RFCs. Um, and since then, there has been a fairly significant work of bringing uh, amendments in the process sense of the world to that specification. Um, to this day, I think we are 48 maybe uh, such amendments. Um, and so just to clarify what this process is, so we have the recommendation as we thought it was perfect uh, three years ago. And as we keep implementing and uh, comparing how the various browsers uh, behave, as we keep identifying uh, new needs that the specification didn't address, we craft these changes to the uh, recommendation make sure that they get uh, approved by the working group and uh, track if and when they get uh, implemented by uh, browsers. Um, and through the WC process, now that uh, as you collect these amendments, you can uh, republish a recommendation uh, through basically a three-stage process for these amendments. First, you can publish them as candidate amendments. Uh, it's basically just telling the world that you are uh, working on these changes and that uh, you think they are good changes, but they are not uh, normative yet in the sense of uh, the process document. Um, at some point, and that's going to be the focus of the discussion today, at some point you want to make these uh, candidate amendments normative, official, and so to do that, you need to uh, make them uh, proposed amendments. Um, so you need, as a, we need as a working group to say, we think this set of amendments are actually a better representation of what we want to express with the specification. And so we want them to become part of the normative <laughs> version of WebRTC. Um, and once we do that, once we publish these proposed amendments, then there is a, a, a review process to make sure uh, everything lines up correctly. We need to, there will be a wide review of these amendments. There will be a WCC advisory committee review of these amendments. And if all, all goes well at the end of that review period of 60 days, then these proposed amendments get uh, fully integrated in the recommendation. The specific proposal on the table is that among these uh, now 48 amendments, we've identified um, 28 uh, of them that uh, have received enough uh, testing and implementation, in particular, have been at least implemented in uh, two different engines uh, that we think, uh, or at least that's my proposal, that we should make them uh, pro propose amendments and start that uh, last call for proposed amendment review process uh, for them. Um, and the next few, few slides will be summarizing what those uh, amendments are and the level of review and testing they, they got. 
before diving into that, any question on the process, on the purpose of this uh, recycling? It, it, it's, it's pretty clear, but it's also uh, very involving. Like uh, it's each individual amendment that we that we discuss in this working group, that we discuss in the uh, editor's meeting, and that we already discuss six months later again. Uh, so it's uh, it it's very heavyweight. I, I was thinking that it would be something like we we do the same things, but at the end we have this batch of amendments, uh, all of them, not just the twenty eight, but all of them, and we would say push a button and go for it because we we did the work before so why are we why doing this revalidation work now so that's a very fair question um i think part of it is well recognizing the work we've done <laughs> as these 48 amendments have indeed received a lot of discussion i think it's important to realize that not all of those have been implemented in two engines yet um so we could bring the 48 if the 48 had been implemented. They haven't yet. Um, I certainly don't propose that we dive back into reviewing the 48, uh, even the 28 amendments here, uh, but just, uh, I guess, the last validation that the group is comfortable that indeed these amendments have received enough uh, testing and implementation before we claim so to, to the world. So you, really more of a last step validation for the working group. So this is a requirement for a wide uh, review of this or? So the wide review is uh, implicit in the last call for proposed amendment. So once we do that step, the, the onus is then on the horizontal groups to do their reviews. It's not on us to actually beg for them. So. Yeah. So how do we track these amendments that are not getting implemented somehow as well? I have the full list. <laughs> so we, uh, if you click on the implementation and interoperability link, uh, it actually goes to a document that extracts data from WPT uh, and compares it with the data in our amendments list to figure out which uh, amendments haven't received any implementation or only one implementation. So that's how we can track where we're missing uh, action. There are also a few that simply had not passed, so it's hard to say if this has been implemented or not. OK, um, so let's maybe go back to the slide. Um, so the first category of uh, amendments. Um, so our alignments were basically, we are aligning the spec with existing implementations. So here the implementation work was uh, limited. In some cases, the uh, test work was limited as well. Um, but these are like an important maintenance aspect of, of the work. Again, I don't propose uh, we go through this. Uh, uh, I filed an issue, I think, 10 days ago, which uh, has all those links if you want to uh, look in more depth. But essentially, I think these amendments are fairly simple in that sense. It's just reflecting the reality uh, of the world. Next slide. Uh, a few uh, amendments. Uh, aren't matched by uh, test cases with new results because they are essentially unobservable. So they, they are substantive in the sense that they change what uh, the normative surface of the specification, um, but they are not observable from uh, uh, at least the JavaScript uh, side of things. Um, and so again, this one, I think, are fairly easy to we agree since they, they were basically approved as a working group. Uh, there are a couple of them that, uh, at least as far as I could determine, are not really testable uh, in WPT, but I think uh, are basically okay from an implementation perspective. The 
implementation defined numbers of I servers and uh, the encoder resolution scale resolution done by. Uh, next slide. And finally, a number of more uh, substantive changes. Uh, so things that we simply are not uh, aligning or making unobservable changes uh, too, but things where the working group agreed that we needed to, to change uh, the behavior of implementations and for which implementations have indeed uh, started to align, uh, at least at least two of them, uh, not, not necessarily all of them for all of these uh, amendments, but I think it's a fairly strong signal that uh, we're getting uh, convergence uh, on implementation on this. Um, and Colin, uh, uh, sorry, I see you have the queue. I may have missed you. No, no it, it was fine. I, I could have broken it. I, um, I, I this slide on the ones on the previous slides. I guess the question is, do you track which ones might have, um, you know, not backwards compatible breaking changes to existing uh, code that is out there? Um, so on this one, the, the, the unobservable amendments. Uh, by definition, cannot break any code. Okay. Um, but this one uh, could, uh, I think the concept has been that as we were discussing those changes, uh, there was already a lot of backwards compatibility uh, discussion. In most cases, it was either addition of new features, so they don't really break anything, they bring something new, or uh, basically, I mean, some of them you could call clarifications or at least alignments of implementations among each other. Like there, there wasn't a single behavior. There wasn't clarity on the spec. Like if you look at the various uh, uh, connection state, uh, it's unlikely that it creates actual backwards compatibility issues, but it was likely that there was uh, interoperability issues before they were set. Okay. Well, well I mean, I, look, look, I know we put huge focus on not breaking backwards compatibility just in general as we made these changes. I'm just wondering if, if that's one of the things you sort of track is whether, and, and I guess you're, you're saying you're fairly unlikely for all of them to have any significant issues. So yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So to your specific question, uh, that hasn't um, been part of actually, the Actually, that's not that quite is. true, Colin. Okay. Uh, 2926 did have concerns about interop uh, from the ITF because it appeared in... But we'll get to that in a bit later. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, I guess in terms of reviewing, if there is any uh, last word to be said about these amendments, that list is probably the one where uh, there needs to be the more uh, focus on. It would be a shame that we get to bring these amendments to REC just to discover they were, in fact, a bad idea. <laughs> um, uh, and next slide, I think that's just the next steps. So yeah, the goal here then is to get working group consensus on uh, those list of amendments that are being ready for, again, this final integration. Uh, once we have that, uh, we'll proceed with uh, uh, process review uh, as required. And if all goes well, after 60 days, uh, we'll go from having this 48 list of amendments to having only, I don't know how my maths works, but around 15 to 20 candidate uh, changes uh, to, to track. And of course, there will be more. Uh, we keep doing that uh, recycling. I think once we've done this big batch, we'll also have hopefully better processes and uh, approaches to keep that list shorter and do this maybe on a more regular basis. Uh, technically, we could do this exercise every six months. I don't know that we necessarily want to be uh, quick in our iterations, but that's uh, at least what the process uh, looks for. Any question or comment? Um, <clears throat> just a comment that we we should have uh, we should take the habit of uh, for any new amendment that is uh, changing behavior we should file a, a bug 
on uh, like uh, the user agents and uh, keep a link somewhere on the on the GitHub issue. Uh, we we're not really doing that. Sometimes we are doing it, but uh, it seems like a, a good practice that we should uh, we should try to like for tests. We we are now in a good place. We we are always thinking about it, and we are always adding the label and so on. So I think we we are good there. But for filing bugs, um, it's not something that we that we think. So we about. could actually then enforce it with our amendment process, where you would need to have that link in the amendments. Uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, but uh, at least uh, we we should uh, like uh, the editors should uh, should should try to enforce. Uh, like uh, at the time we we are discussing uh, whether a test is needed needed, we should also say okay, let's file. Let's have uh, issues filed as well. Uh, Harold? Yeah, just mentioned that uh, the web platform this platform actually has a mechanism for attaching bugs to mm. failing tests. <laughs> Perhaps we should focus on doing that and including mark marking up the, the, the failing tests we have with bugs. Yeah, that would be good too, yeah. Uh, so speaking to the to the group, uh, is there any uh, is there any is there any, anyone seeing a reason not to do this, given that it seems that Dom is doing most of the work? <laughs> <laughs> I really love the Dom is doing most of the work part. So thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> as, a, that's my favorite. <laughs> as long as you're promising to continue for the next 10 years, we are good. <laughs> if we can get uh, those uh, 20 something out of the way, then I would be happier. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I have some things like uh, I was uh, I was trying to rev revise the language around Codex because that's later in the agenda that uh, got it rolled back because it was simply not ready yet. So that's not part of what, part of the amendments uh, listed. Uh, so can I take it as consensus of the working group that we should, uh, we should do this? Seems like a decision. They're running so fast. I hope that nobody is intending to come in uh, at the exact moment when their item is being discussed. But now we have what I promised, Codex. Uh, so me and Henrik have been uh, noodling about Codex and this pesky problem of uh, Codex that we can only send. I mean, this we came at this from two ends. One was one was one was the end of uh, of uh, what do we actually do when we have a codex that, where we can only send it and not receive it. The other one was actually that uh, when we discussed encode the transform. And wanted to have the ability to inject custom codecs or custom wrappers uh, around data in in the encoder transform. Yeah, Niver and I ended up with uh, uh, an API shape that required you had the ability to add a codec to a single transceiver. And uh, this meant, of course, that the list of codecs that you want you want to, to negotiate is transceiver specific. And that is not how the current spec is written. So we discussed this uh, from sometime in 2023 to April of this year when we, we had consensus of the working group, we believe, on the encoder transform change. And I started to try to write the corresponding text for WebRTC PC. Well, I got halfway, and then I got distracted into actually implementing what I, uh, what what I had specified. 
and uh, that meant I didn't get around to concluding the other time. So we roll, rolled that back because it was incomplete. And I'm still working out the code for doing this. So the principle of STP is that you use it to negotiate pay payload types. Payload types are an RTP-specific concept. It's a one-byte value that you assign for a codec. Payload types are tied to one specific direction. You can have uh, the number 100 meaning, meaning one codec in one direction and another codec in the opposite direction. And that's not the conflict. Usually we try to avoid doing that because it confuses the hell out of people. But it's, it's legal and it has to be supported. SDP, when you negotiate on the, a send, send receive and codec basically says that you have this M line with the list of numbers next to it. These are the these are the codecs I'm prepared to receive. But as we have had a long discussion with about where exactly do we specify what we can send if that's not the same thing? I mean, if we can both send and receive a specific codec, that's no problem. We just put it in the STP and get a and assign a, a payload type for it. But if we can only send it or only receive it, what should we do? All right. So I'll take it from here. And so, yes, I'll repeat this. Uh, it's what we can receive, but I added an asterisk because there's uh, there's the fine print, the, the caveat. This still influences what we can send. And, and that's very important for, for backwards compatibility. So uh, first of all is if you create, create an offer uh, and, and you have preferences and the other endpoint does not have any preferences, uh, they will use the order you uh, used. So if you say put H.264 first, you're going to send H.264 unless the other endpoint has a preference that, that changes that. And the other thing it says is that uh, if you have preferences, you must exclude uh, anything in your preference list that's not on your in your preference list must be excluded. So if you put preferences that only includes what you want to receive, you're gonna exclude the uh, send only codex, which could be a, a, a problem in in some cases, especially if you try to offer what what you want to send. But the the point of this slide is just that uh, even if this is what we want to receive, it it can influence sending as well. So preferences have to take both into consideration. All right. So how do we deal with unidirectional codex? Uh, uh, just one question, slide. Henrik. Uh, yes. Um, I think the question has come up in some codex of what, what the meaning of the word codec is. And in particular with H265, you know, uh, there was there's a desire to not list every profile that can be supported. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we can get into it at this, some point, but the actual dynamics of the offer differs between send receive and, you know, the send only and receive only situation. Like, uh, I, I think that's, that's interesting to think about, but in terms of uh, negotiating payload types, I think that becomes a, a, a like a side problem. Like right. if you, if you happen to know that codec A is compatible with codec B, and you just sneakily use the other payload type and the other endpoint will never notice because it's compatible. Uh, that seems like a separate problem from how, how does uh, negotiating one of these things work in the first place. So I'm kind of ignoring that problem for now, but it's true. You can do, you know, you can uh, negotiate some advanced H.264 thing and then do baseline and it's still gonna work. I'm pre pretending that doesn't exist. Uh, for now, the next well, slide. But it's why you have the Q4? Or... Uh, well, um, I think it, this might come up later. Um, okay. But it, it, yeah. And you have Peter on the Q as well. I don't know if you want to take him now. Or... Uh, it, 
if one someone wants to speak, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering if it's uh, a reasonable answer to say don't use send receive lines, or if like oh, that's really next slide. Okay, okay, I'm just getting ahead. Sorry, you jump in the gun. So next slide, we have this beautiful section. 5.1 and 3264 to the rescue, which says that send only stream should indicate codecs for sending, receive only should indicate codecs for receiving, and send receive should indicate codecs the, the offer is willing to send and receive. So it seems to answer our quest, uh, these questions. But notice how it's a should, not a must. And uh, like someone pointed out earlier, if, if, it's, if it's single direction, it's pretty straightforward, right? Because there's no conflict here. The question is when when the when it's a send receive M section, then unidirectionality could potentially become a problem. Uh, so the, so the question is, do we take this literally and say only send receive codex, or do we want to allow? So the use case pointed out was you have a receive only codec. What's the harm in offering both H two six five receive only and H two six four send receive? Uh, You'll never be able to send it, but if you can receive it, why not allow negotiating it? It seems useful. So the risk is if you can receive H265, you can't send it, and the other endpoint can send and receive it, it's allowed to remove. You offer this, and they remove H264 from the offer, and you get an answer back where the only uh, codec available is H265. Now, you can receive it but you've ended up in a situation where you can't send the only codec that's left in your list uh, after filtering out on the other endpoint. And well, the, so the question is, if this is a problem, because- Well, the, the other problem, Henrik- No, 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 no yeah. wait, wait, wait. Can, can you back into what, I mean, like, look, your, your use case as you just described it as, you can't do X, yet you offer to do X and then right. things do badly. I mean, that's insane. Like what, you can't do that. Like what's, what's driving wanting to do this? I'm, I don't get it. And it actually goes even worse than that, Colin, because what profile do you offer in H265 in this weirdo situation? Do you offer, sometimes you can receive way more and receive only than you can both encode and decode, right? So you're going to offer the wrong profile too. So yeah, it's, it's just, it just create, it's crazy. So, 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 I mean, I guess what I'm proposing is like, doctor, doctor, this hurts. Like, don't, don't do that. Is there some reason that's driving us to want to be able to do this? Because I'm not, I'm not getting what that is. If it, if it is, because this seems like this seems very problematic to do an offer answer. Yeah. This is actually confusing implementers, by the way. We might, <laughs> yes. it's really confusing. Like I got a question from a, developer actually putting this into Chrome, like what the hell do I offer? I think we've lived in this nice world where uh, all codecs are kind of send receive uh, in most of the time and, and, and we haven't really hit these issues. Um, actually, we have hit them with both H.264 and H.265 because of profiles. Because of profiles, all right. Yeah. I mean, even pick any codec ever the send capabilities were seldom the same as the receive capabilities, right? Right. I mean, yeah. Or, or on a given device, yeah. right? It's just like the device capabilities are never symmetric. They're almost always asymmetric. But then we get around this problem now because we just list all of them. So. I see. You all, right? Like, that's why I kind of think of this as a separate issue, but maybe it's not. Uh, but that's, that's my thinking. It's like, well, if I can do ABC, why the hell am I only negotiating A, right? It seems like you're, you're I mean, if you, if you offer A and, and you do B, I, I feel like you're on your own. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but you better know what you're doing. Uh, API wise, things should work. Like if, if I say A, A should work. If I say B, B should work. At least that's, that's how I've been operating when I think about this. Um, but let's go through the options. Uh, a further discussion can pursue in the, the slide. So again, I think if, if the direction is uh, send only or receive only, it's straightforward, we know what to do. But then uh, then we have different options here in how, how much do we avoid the foot gun and how much power do we wanna give the, the, uh, the app. So proposal A, avoid foot gun, means you only do send receive codecs on send receive uh, 
uh, M sections. Uh, and that will avoid foot GANs, although if we already have this, this problem with profiles, maybe this isn't backwards compatible. I'm not sure now. Um, uh, but this is the least powerful version because you can't you can't uh, mix. And then proposal B it makes it a little bit softer. It says uh, we'll exclude the send only codex, but we'll uh, allow receive only codex. Um, so you can offer you can offer to receive things, uh, but you can. The downside is the problem we described there, there where. Uh, if the answerer is filtering out codecs from your list, you could end up in a situation where you can decode everything you receive, but you can't send anything because they removed the only codecs you know how to set. And I'm kind of arguing that this is okay because uh, the like because because this this seems compatible with what we're already doing. Um, like you can whether you send or not, it's not something you have to renegotiate. Uh, so we can easily make the, the sender uh, inactive, but this is this is compatible with this thinking that we're negotiating what we want to receive, without forbidding uh, offering things. Uh, and then the proposal C is the max foot gun thing, where you just like we just put every codec in there. Uh, then you can get decode errors, and I I think this and in this case app must be so smart that I think it's a bad idea. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, out of A, B, C, I'm leading towards B, but then uh, there's this uh, proposal D option. If we re change the rules and we uh, relax the, the, the RFC rules a bit, we could we could list all the codecs in A equals R to B map lines. So everything gets payload types without listing them in the M line. This would allow you to sort of signal, hey, I can I can send this without saying, I prefer to receive this at the same time. That seems nicer from a signaling perspective. Although I do want to point out if, if you're allowed to add codex that you want to receive that wasn't signaled in proposal B, I'm not sure that proposal D allows you to do more things than you can already do with proposal B, but it would make signaling less confusing. Now, the reason why I, I... I suggested that was because uh, the 3274 language is actually ambiguous in that uh, if you yeah, quote here, it, it talks about should indicate codex. Now that can be interpreted in two ways. It means that the codec number is included on the M line. Or it can mean that the codec is included in the a, a, with an RT, RTP map line. So proposal D is kind of trying to see if we can get something useful out of uh, niggling in between those two things. I mean, uh, if you if you want if you get the payload type suge suggestion for a codec. You can certainly include that codec in your answer, and then you're you can say that you're willing to receive it by including it in your M line, even if, even though the other guy didn't. But it's kind of trying to finagle uh, something that STP has been unclear about being able to do for the last twenty years. So I'm hesitant. I I like it for the reasons that you said. But since we don't have an API to say check the RTP map lines independent of uh, other lists of codecs, like it seems that whatever even whatever is signaled, at the end of the day we we exclude everything that's not in the preference list. So it seems like uh, I don't know if the app would parse STP check that oh you listed codec X. Therefore, I'll put X in my preference vers versus the app just putting X in their preference to start with because they just know they like X, uh, and it could be added regardless of if there's a, if it's listed or not. So we we have a queue, uh, Peter, Bernard, and then you. All right. So my proposal E is: if you want receive only codex, you create a transceiver that's receive only, and you make a separate transceiver that's send only. And that's the only way you can. That's actually proposal A. 
proposes A is you avoid okay. foot GANs, but that means if you want something that's send only, you have to have a send only transceiver. And if you want something that's receive only, you have to have a receive only transceiver. Okay. I, I didn't see that like spelled out in A, but yeah, that, okay. I like A then. Yeah. So I also like A for a little bit different reason than Peter, because um, we're trying to go through the HBC stuff right now and trying to avoid the H264 laundry list. Um, and I think it, it, it gives significant clarity. So as an example, as you go through the profiles you support with A, uh, on the send receive M line, you would basically only include the highest profile that you can both encode and decode. So it's fairly clear. On the send only line, you'd include the highest profile that you can encode. And on the receive only M line, you'd include the highest profile that you can decode. So you don't have this laundry list of profiles that you, you put in. It's actually really, really kind of very clean and, and simple. Um, although I think a, it might run afoul of what you've been defining as a codec, as a combination of a specific MT, FMTP parameters and the, the MIME type, but it is consistent with the actual RFCs for, for HEBC, which would be 7798. Um, so I'm hoping that proposal A will be the simplest from an implementation point of view. Um, as a default, uh, I also like proposal A. Like you, you're you not a well-versed developer, you just use the API and by default you get like send receive codecs in uh, send receive uh, transceivers. I'm okay with uh, having the web developer uh, call an API to say, hey, I'm including these other codecs that are send only, and I know what I'm doing. Uh, that's fine as well. But I think by default, uh, like if you're doing a bare bone uh, API call with offers and answers, proposal A is fine. Uh, we have set codec preferences. Maybe it can be used uh, to extend uh, what would be the default, which would be proposal A to, to more complex uh, lens. It's actually that that sounds even though I, I uh, argued with proposal B, uh, it does make sense to start at the conservative place and then yeah. uh, expand if we see a use case for it. But exactly. it might be that people are using unidirectional transceivers anyway, and they just don't care about this. And then it's it's better to keep it simple. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I was actually going to uh, propose uh, proposal B here because um, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but if the offer is specifying what it can receive. So if, if Chrome can, for instance, can it receive hypothetically H.265 and H.264, even on the send receive stream, it doesn't seem uh, that problematic to me to say that uh, because if the other end is say Safari and wants to send and can actually send H.265, it can do so. The only problem is if, if that that side purposely removes the H.264 codec and um, just don't do that. But uh, it, it do... gets, if you, if you, uh, right, actually well, this is where. And also I, I'm trying yeah. to sort of squint a little bit and looking at SDP here, but maybe I shouldn't, but it seems to me that having these dependencies, ideally as an API service, I would love to get away from the direction mattering that much because that can be renegotiated over time. And you could say every renegotiation is an opportunity to provide different codecs, but it gets quite complicated. And I'm not sure that this is the real problem that we're solving. So if everyone else wants to do A because that's conservative, uh, you know, I'm not a SDP expert per se, so um, but I also, at the same time, I don't see that much problem with B. But I'm happy to learn otherwise. Uh, well, I, I think so. With B, you're you say what you prefer to receive. You don't prefer you don't say what you prefer to send. Correct. And I, I'm right. thinking yes. So I think that works. But I think I'm wondering if it's a problem actually. Yeah, if let you me, let, me, let me walk you through the problem because that was going to be more or less my comment. Um, yeah. Let's say we have an old codec and new codec called A and B, okay? And you put, and we're doing proposal B here. Um, 
I'll, I'll use 264 and 265, less confusing. Okay, so you send um, 264 and 265, and then the other side is going to send you 265 because you can receive that, but it decides, but, but how does it know that it shouldn't remove the 264? And you said, just don't do that. But that's the problem, is at some point in time, you do want to do that. You want to get rid of using some old Kodak that you never want to use again. Otherwise, you'll use 264 from now to the end of time. So it, you, this is, you know, proposal B is not possible to represent an SDP. And I, I look, JSUP may be a little bit vague or something on that, but JSUP is, is definitive ref references SDP. And, SD, you know, offer answer SDP, I don't, I, don't, I don't really see it being expressive enough for you to be able to do proposal B and have it work in a, in a reliable way, um, uh, you, you know, in offer answer SDP. Um, you could go change offer answer SDP to have be more expressive for sure, um, but this this doesn't. I don't. I don't see how this works. I, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't get how. So, you... so you're saying the, the only path forward where we can remove H two six four and be sure that it doesn't blow up is if the transceiver is unidirectional, because then we can keep H two six five in the answer. Well, if you want to have a time period where you can negotiate asymmetric things both directions yeah i think you're going to need to use send only streams and uh, or sorry you're going to need to receive only or send only streams and you know to, to do those you can't really mix them in sdp in, in the way you want to do here right um so i mean i guess I, I don't see how proposal b c and d interoperate with sdp offer answer really is, is the problem so that pushes me towards a but i mean if b in particular here i i don't you know, if Chrome sends something to Safari and I mean, like, how does Safari know whether it should do 264 or 265? Like, what does it do? Like, it has a preference, right? <laughs> um, so I, I just don't, like, like, Proposal B seems to rely on the other side having magic out of bound information about what it should do to try and choose what to do. Am I, am I understanding this wrong? No, Colin, you, the... Uh, ABT core working group gave the same feedback you've just described. Oh, okay. I'm not, then I'm not shocked I said that. Then, so I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. That, right. that seems like a reasonable answer. Uh, uh, though you could argue that uh, for the same reason that we're saying, uh, well, you can always go back to a send only, receive only transceiver if we're only discussing send receive here. You could apply that to. Uh, to your deprecation of H.264 as well, right? But uh, but it sounds like uh, I, I don't have a problem if uh, everyone else is aligning around A. Uh, it might be the le path of less uh, least uh, confusion. Yeah, so uh, so uh, I agree with A being the path of least confusion. Uh, one thing I wonder about is, uh, do we care about what happens when you change the direction of a transceiver? Uh, right, ooh, that's right. what I wanted to avoid. Yeah, so uh, direction dependencies. Yeah, so so uh, the thing is that once you've allocated that payload type for a transceiver for, on that on that on that transport. As far as I understand, RTP rules, not SDP rules, that payload type is gone. You can never change it to some other, something else. Is that correct? Bernard, Probably. What do you mean by something else? Like, say so you went from send receive with one profile level to to send, and the profile level changes. Are you saying? Are you asking if you can really use the payload type? I don't see why not. Like Cullen, so, would there be a reason why I would have to change payload types if I change profile levels because the direction changed? Certainly not at the profile level change, but if you right if you change direction, well, actually, I mean, if you were send profile, receive you, and you drop to just yeah. one send or just receive, that'd be no problem. But like if you're if you're actually, I think I may have misspoken. Yeah. I think uh, because if you change the level ID, I don't think you have you have a problem. But if you change the profile, I think you do. Because I think right. profile is is at least in HEBC defined as a defining characteristic of the profile along with the mime type. So let me look at this more closely. But I, I think you might have an issue if you change profiles. 
So, uh, so my worry is uh, if if you Hold change on. from if you have a send only and allocate ninety seven to let's say H two six four high, then you change the direction to send receive. And that, and in that mode, you can only support uh, constraint, right? And uh, either you have to allocate a new payload type so that so you can know that uh, you uh, you're going to re that uh, whatever you you get on that payload type is is constrained, or you reuse the payload type and say, okay, let's hope. Do let's we hope have a strong use case, case for? For reusing payload type. I mean, in one of the earlier slides, you say payload types can collide for send versus receive, but we try to avoid it because it's confusing. And I'm kind of, when you're talking about this, I keep thinking, isn't, isn't it confusing? Why, why don't you just, if you're going to use a new pay, uh, another profile, why not just use a different payload type? Because you're going to have to renegotiate anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think you might have to. I mean, uh, you you have to renegotiate to to change the direction anyway. So you 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 can you can easily add more codex stuff yeah. to, to it too. I just wonder if you, if we had okay problem flagged, but uh, uh, otherwise we seem to have a have a convergence on speak speaking with my chair head on. Uh, you know, my ears. Uh, we seem to have a convergence towards proposal A as. Uh, the one that we're, we're pretty sure doesn't conflict with anything. And uh, anyone who's trying to be fancy should use you know, directional transceivers. And the, the fact that I started doubting about proposal B as soon as I get questions probably speaks to how confusing this is. <laughs> yes. so. Okay. So uh, let's uh, record a consensus so far of uh, going with proposal A. Don't be fancy. Seems acceptable to everyone. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Can we settle this? <laughs> Miracle of miracles. Okay. Uh, sorry, I tried to raise my hand. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. I put a plus Q in the chat. Is it monitored? Uh, not, not the chat. You have to use the IRC chat. <clears throat> Oh, the IRC chat to put uh, questions. Okay. All right. I'll try to do that next time. But you have I have a question for uh, No, I was going to ask about uh, backwards compatibility in websites, but I guess if we go with option A, it's not really a problem. And applications will just have to migrate to the type of usage if they want to have uh, un uh, send only I... or receive only codecs. It's actually a very good question. Like it's it's the most conservative, so it sounds safe. But if if this is already shipped and suddenly we start filtering out certain profiles because uh, it works in one direction and not two, that could actually that could actually become become a compat issue. Like if 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 we today send put all the profiles in a send receive, uh, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah, my, my impression was that proposal B was closer to current implementations, but maybe that's wrong. Right. <laughs> right, tests. Mm -hmm. Yes, this does need tests. Well, tests, but also like what's compatibility evaluation. Like tests will check what's current behavior, but uh, the impact on existing apps is going to be important. Yeah. Okay. So let that be part of the notes. Now we're only five minutes ahead of schedule. But Samir is here and can take us through ice transport extensions. Yeah. Thanks, Harald. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Samir Vijaykar. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide. So a couple of uh, interim meetings ago, I introduced a proposal for a new API that would let uh, apps 
uh, initiate outgoing ice checks and observe and potentially prevent uh, outgoing ice checks initiated by the ice agent. Uh, so at the time, I was perhaps not as clear as I could have been about uh, the exact uh, motivation for the proposal. Uh, there were questions about exactly why it was needed and what shape uh, any proposal should take. So I'll try and get to those questions today. And uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the slides, uh, uh, I'll be able to explain more clearly the motivation now for the proposal and uh, what it can look like. So on to the next slide. So to start off with, what exactly do we mean by ice checks and how do those work today? So at the beginning of an ice session, the ice agent forms candidate pairs together with the local candidates uh, by matching the local candidates and the remote candidates. And then at the beginning, it cycles through those uh, discovered candidate pairs, uh, sending ice checks on each of them, uh, paced about 15 milliseconds apart. If it doesn't receive a response within the timeout, uh, the check is retransmitted with exponential back off. Uh, and on the other end, when uh, the other ICE agent receives a check, it sends a response, but then it also triggers a check that bypasses the queue. And that is to make ICE converge faster on candidates pairs that actually work. And then once uh, the working candidate pairs are discovered, uh, one of them is selected and nominated, and that's what uh, the ICE agency used to send and receive uh, media or whatever data. Uh, so that's the overview. And then once uh, all of this has happened, keep alive are sent typically around every 15 seconds when there's no media being sent. And that's to make sure that the nut, any nut bindings along the path stay fresh. Uh, but on top of that, there's also a consent mechanism, uh, which basically states that the ICE agent is allowed to send uh, send data to the other peer on uh, a candidate pair as long as there was a successful uh, check that was done within the previous 30 seconds. And if that 30 second period uh, expires without a renewal, then the ICE agent can't send data on that. So to make sure that consent is fresh, there's uh, renewal uh, checks and every four to six seconds. Uh, uh, and yeah, the higher frequency of the consent renewal basically means that keep lives are redundant. So that's a quick overview. Next slide, please. Right, so what exactly is the problem that we are trying to address? So uh, with the new APIs that we've uh, worked on over the last uh, year or so in the working group, it's possible for an app to retain additional candidate pairs in addition to the active candidate pair that it's using to send media. And then over the, during the course of an ICE session, uh, the app can switch to a different candidate pair without an ICE restart. Uh, so what that means is that any retained candidate pairs that are not being used to send media, uh, they will have keep alive or consent renewals continue to be sent on those pairs. So uh, here's an example scenario that we're trying to address. Uh, let's say an app starts off by, user, uh, by selecting one candidate pair to send data, maybe a UDP pair, uh, but it retains additional candidate pairs, perhaps a relay and a TCP pair. Uh, now maybe the device only has one network link, so all the candidate pairs share the same network link, which may be uh, perhaps a bandwidth constraint. Uh, or another scenario is that uh, if we are running on a mobile device, the app starts off by using Wi-Fi, and there's a second pair that uses a cellular network, uh, but the app wants to conserve power by keeping the cellular modem as dormant as much as possible and only send uh, pings on that when needed. Uh, so this wasn't really a problem before because I would converge on one candidate pair and then you know, anything that wasn't really needed would be discarded and we would stop sending checks on any additional candidate pairs. But now if we can retain additional pairs, then checks are going to be sent on those. So perhaps the app wants to uh, reduce the frequency of sending checks on additional candidate pairs. Uh, maybe instead of every 20 seconds, uh, oh, sorry, instead of every five seconds, uh, consent can be renewed every 20 seconds since it expires after 30 seconds. Uh, and then if the additional, um, if, uh, if the active candidate degrades, uh, maybe uh, there's some packet loss, 
the app notices a uh, drop in reliability, a drop in RAM bandwidth. It wants to switch to one of uh, the alternatives. And to do that, it wants to send ICE checks on all the addition candidate pairs right away, figure out which one has the best RDT, and then switch to that one. So that's the kind of scenario that uh, we would uh, like to address and perhaps give the app additional capability to handle that. Uh, so yeah, just so uh, Bernard, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, it, it It sounds nice, but, you know, after you've nominated, right, uh, under traditional ICE, you, you can't do this. So, you know, have you, is this a situation pre-nomination or, or after nomination? Right, so uh, we've got an API that lets us cancel nomination. And so we will continue to send data on a candidate pair without setting the use candidate attribute on it. And then there's another API which lets us select a different candidate pair for sending data. And so then we, uh, the uh, ICE agent will start sending data on that one, again, without sending uh, without setting the use candidate uh, attribute. So the app could potentially switch between several candidate pairs over the course of session. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, that, but you know, in, in normalized, there's no concept of canceling a nomination. I mean, you right. ice, yeah. ice, re, ice restarts and stuff like that, but. Yeah, right. So yeah, once nomination has gone through, then there's really no need for this uh, because you're going to use that pair. And if you want to change something, you do an ice restart. And so you probably don't need to know exactly what the current RTT is or uh, uh, mess with the uh, default algorithm for sending checks. <clears throat> I think the, the one way to think about this, Bernard, is that um, this allows the JavaScript to do better ice by uh, avoiding the problem with nomination. And we could do even better if we picked up the standard on the renomination attribute. Right, right, right. Um, but even if you don't have that attribute, you can still just not nominate and still be Right. Well, I I understand if you, if you haven't nominated yet, I, this makes sense to me. Yeah. So if we if we go the route of picking up the renomination attribute, we could allow nomination. But for now, without that, then just turning off nomination is kind of the workaround. Right. So do you have control over that? I, for, I forgot. Can, can yeah. So there is an API that lets us uh, okay. cancel nomination. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, oh. later, Keith. Was first. Uh, so, the short, short note, short note on that is uh, nomination was probably a bad idea in this context. So let's not do it. Janivar. Uh, well, yes. Uh, well, that might have been a bad idea, and then we should change that. I think uh, it seems a bit hackish to defer nomination. Forever, I guess that's the idea. You defer nomination forever, and then you leave the browser, the ICE agent, in a more active state where it keeps checking. And I just wanted to make sure that why do all this? Why, why is uh, restart ICE prohibited? And restart ICE, in my understanding, is that you can call restart ICE without disrupting an existing connection, right? And it, it should seamlessly uh, switch to new candidate pairs already. Is that wrong? So you can continue sending while performing a restart, but with the restart, you still have to gather candidate pairs again. You still have to do a full round of checks on all of them. So it's just a more heavy duty operation than just canceling nomination and then see, switching to a different pair. Sure, but the net effect is the same, right? And uh, so how often does this happen, I guess, if there's a deterioration of the active candidate pair? Um, I mean, doing a restart ice might actually, if situations have changed, wouldn't that be better to do a complete re uh, ice restart than rely on candidate pairs you already uh, gathered last time? Or is it the same? Uh, unless uh, you've had uh, new networks come up. Uh, and you still are working with the same set of uh, network interfaces that you had before the restart, uh, this would potentially be a lot faster than doing a full ice restart, doing a full set of things. And then, uh, yeah, so it would be 
lighter and faster. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, I, I'm just trying to get at the, the motivation for this. Uh, the, is uh, is it more? And then I have a question about the the speed of the restart because that's really appealing to me. But the the motivation is it more to save to to, to save power to not wake up the cellular radio, or is it more to save bandwidth? Because even if we're doing them every twenty seconds or five seconds, I'm not I I'm not sure that the power or bandwidth are going to be actually significantly saved in every case. Like I'm just I'm trying to get what problem we're solving here. Yeah. So there's two parts to it. One is to prevent and reduce the frequency of checks, and then the other one is to actually send more checks that are initiated by the app itself. So I think your question is about the first part, that is to prevent ice checks, and uh, uh, it's it's both. I think bandwidth is probably a slightly smaller problem than uh, when you have a power sensitive device, and uh, we have seen on cellular networks in particular that the modem goes to sleep for a longer duration of time or it goes to a very low power state and then if you wake it up even within every 10 seconds or so then it takes a while for the modem to go back to a low power state it stays in that higher power state waiting for any more activity whereas you've basically just woken it up to send one packet and then get one response back and so it helps to uh, it helps quite a bit to actually uh, space out the things uh, further apart what? What time are you seeing that it takes to go back to to go back to a low power state? Because I was under the impression it was more like thirty seconds. Yeah, it's something of the order of uh, fifteen to thirty seconds. I do not recall the exact. Uh, so it, that, no, I'm just saying that if it's in that order, whether you do a check every five seconds or every twenty seconds, makes no difference to power usage, right? Because you're still inside that window. If it's more than 30 seconds, uh, yeah. But if it's less than 30 seconds, then it would make a difference well, if you do it seconds. as close to the... Anyway, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get to where, where the problem is. It sounds like there's some, some data to be learned there. So I guess the other thing is like, look, the reason for the consent checks to a large degree is to to, to limit the, the length of time that a DDoS could, ha could happen. So I think we'd have to trade that off with this, though I'm not necessarily seeing that be a problem. Um, and then the two other comments I was going to say is I... I, I know like ISIS takes so long, right? So painful um, that, but there's been lots of like some ICE devices and this isn't discussed in the WebRTC spec, but some other ones do it is you can remember what your ICE results were from a previous time and then prioritize which ICE checks you do first based on what you've seen work successfully in the past. And that might be um, a path here that, that helped you do this. And then my last comment had to do with the nomination um, there's definitely some uh, websites like one we're using right now, um, where if you don't nominate within 30 seconds, the, it basically considers it a failed call and it'll disconnect the call. Um, so I think there's a, a, a fair amount of app behavior relying on nomination happening, not just never nominating. Um, so anyway, that's that's. Uh, so I, I think there'd be lots of interoperability problems if we didn't if we never nominated. Yeah, uh, I, I have another series of comments a lot, to follow up on what Cullen said. You know, we now have APIs in the browser that try to minimize power usage, but they actually operate significantly differently because uh, basically you need an event that tells you when when you're uh, already in the high power state so you don't wake up the modem. Um, and the, the other thing is there are um, ICE extensions that are proven very successful such as ice mobility um, in the situation where, uh, you know, it, it, essentially ice mobility lets, lets you move around and, and keep connectivity no matter what, almost. Um, so you basically have a candidate and then you can do restart in the background. So essentially you don't lose any connectivity time at all with, uh, with ice mobility. So there's basically ways to achieve more or less what's described here without actually breaking interop. Um, and I, I am concerned about the the power management issues uh, that this will bring up if you don't have the right event structure to t essentially tell you when you when you should do the ice check. I think it it'll degrade the power management pretty significantly. Uh, so maybe a couple of uh, comments in this one. So uh, it's it, I, I mean this doesn't necessarily block you from using any other power man management APIs to uh, 
uh, tune the app's own behavior of uh, preventing checks or sending checks more frequently. Like you can still combine those to create a more efficient uh, process. Uh, the problem is the, AP, the APIs we have are integrated with another things like managed MSE. And you don't want to, I don't think we have a pure power, power management API. Right. So, okay. So Bernard, your, your comment is, is basically that user agents might be in a better position to optimize this than web pages that do not have enough information to make an informed judgment. Right. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. That was going to be my comment as well. Is like, uh, thank you for doing all these tests. And but if there are benefits here that browsers could do, uh, uh, it would be even better if JavaScript applications didn't have to uh, had a simpler way to describe this and just say basically just do this, just do uh, this more lightweight, better thing, without requiring to know exactly all the methods to you know cancel nomination and then change all these things um, to give the user agents more room if we can to, to solve this, if, they, if that works. So that was going to come up in a couple of slides, but uh, okay. basically, yeah, we could have configuration that lets the app sort of guide the ICE agent or the user agent in the right direction. Uh, but it's a matter of balancing how many configuration levers we have versus exactly how much capability we want the app to just go and implement. And this proposal kind of leans towards keeping, uh, I mean, it, it, it in a way, it is a simpler API than giving lots of configuration options and then keeping those consistent uh, with each other. Uh, Peter, you want to come? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that these are not all theoretical things. These are all things people are already doing in mobile apps. And the LibWebRTC already does a lot of this for mobile apps out of the box. Um, these are techniques that are already widely used. And basically, people using techniques like this are asking repeatedly, can I do this in my web app? And the answer right now is no. And so we want to change that so the answer is yes. Um, yeah, um, so I, the, on the nomination front, um, I'm worried that getting rid of nomination loses you potentially some security strength. I mean, I, I know of situations where when a pair has been nominated, all of the other pairs are are removed from, um, like the packets are dropped. They never get into the ice stack. Um, so, you know, you could effectively firewall them out. And I think that's a, I've seen a recent um, DDoS against uh, DTLS that is prevented by that. So I'm worried about dropping nomination completely um, without, a very, very good reason. The other thing I noticed is that in terms of like saying, well, uh, which, so that's kind of, I don't like the way that they're going with nomination, but I do see the necessity for this sort of API. Um, and the, the reason is that, that you can't totally leave it to the user agent is that it's not obvious that the user agent is going to make the right decision. We've seen uh, examples where connectivity oh like retaining connectivity is like the be all and end all and that means that it'll hop networks and actually you'd rather just accept a quarter of a second of silence or or a slightly delayed packet and then come back when the when the connection comes back be on the right network on the much quicker network um so you might know the app may know that and and want to prevent the um, prevent or encourage, depending on what it's doing, uh, um, can allow the doesn't want the user agent to make that choice for it. So I I do think there's there's room for an API like this, but I don't know whether this is the right shape. Right. Uh, I 
just we haven't quite got into the shape yet. Uh, but the point about nomination, so we still haven't prevented uh, or removed the possibility of nomination completely. It is still up to the app to decide not to nominate, and if the app doesn't take any action, then the agent is going to go ahead and nominate as it does today. So unless the app says anything else, things will continue to work the way they do right now. So uh, speaking of history, I first presented this, uh, uh, the ideas behind this, uh, and the name NICER in, at the ITF in July 2021. After having discussed that there, it was uh, clear that uh, the judgment of the community was that embedding this inside browsers would not, that we really didn't know what the algorithm should be, and embedding them inside the browser would be the wrong thing to do. So Samir started out on this journey. We know that approximately five iterations in from where Samir started with the actual, actual spec changes. And uh, we had the discussions about the overall shape of the API and the reasons for, for uh, doing this inside the API in, in the application and not, uh, not, not inside the browser about uh, one and a half, two years ago. So I would suggest that we don't revisit that, that particular consensus at this time. And let's uh, get on with discussing what shape the next iteration of the API, API should be. Yeah, P Peter, you, you mentioned uh, mobile apps that are doing that based on LibreRTC. Uh, so my question was, uh, which API are they using? Is it very similar to what is being proposed there? And the second thing is, what uh, algorithms are they doing to, to, to make their choice? And what input are they using from the system? For instance, uh, if my um, laptop is connecting to a, through my phone, then uh, the algorithm should probably think, oh, I, I should be in cellular mode because I'm actually through a phone that is using cellular and so on. But the web page does not know that at all and might make choices that are uh, actually poor. Um, and we will never be in a position where we will be able to expose that information uh, to web pages. So that's why I'm interested in uh, understanding better what mobile apps uh, are doing today. Because, yeah, we, it, would be, it would be nice to reduce the gap between mobile apps and, uh, and web apps. Um, well, basically you're doing what Samir is describing where there's a, a backup candidate pair. And then when the primary candidate pair stops functioning after some amount of time, it switches to the backup, but it keeps the backup, uh, with checks at a lower rate in order to save battery in case that backup is on the cellular. Now you do have a good point that we're not exposing to the web application, whether or not it's a cellular link or not, at least not directly. There is some information out there that you can infer from. Um, so that that is a, a bit of an issue if we're trying to reach parity with mobile applications. Yeah, we tried to expose that, Peter, and then the privacy folks shut it down. Did I answer all your questions? Sorry, it was a whole bunch all at once. Um, yeah, I, I I kind of think so. Um, if if the only thing the mobile apps are actually using is, uh, am I using a cellular link or not? Then yeah, it's uh, it's really hard. If you're telling me that uh, through WebRTC stats, they would be able to somehow be able to make a very good informed choice. Uh, then the situation so, for me is changing. Yeah, well, so I, I can I think, add... I, I think there are ways to infer it, but I don't really want to say what they are too explicitly because then, you know, somebody might say remove that. 
<laughs> okay. So I, I can at least add that it isn't just uh, the type of network interface that you're using that factors into that. Uh, there's uh, some factors that are on the slide uh, that are also play into it. So in one of the original presentations on this, uh, the scenario described was some, you're talking on your phone via yeah, WebRTC connection, and you're nearing your home and picking up the Wi-Fi signal. Okay, you want to switch to it. But close to your entrance, there's a large tree that happens to block your Wi-Fi signal. So you want to switch back to cellular until you reach your front door when you want to switch switch to the Wi-Fi again. And this uh, the signal you need is actually the quality of each of the connections, which is measurable using this uh, ping results. You don't need the information about what you're attached to. You need the information about which connections actually work. I think in Safari, in terms of network innovations, we are much more uh, closed than what Chrome is doing also, which makes it uh, very different for us. No, we don't need to enumerate. We just need to have, have the multiple available. Uh, we are at time. Okay. And do you want to try to? Uh, I think there's quite a few slides to go. I didn't get very far. So uh, maybe we can continue it at another time. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, is, I... is the next step to pick up where we left off, or uh, does somebody have a better suggestion? So I think we need to continue discussions uh, on the list in the bug and at the next meeting, unfortunately. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for keeping the time. Because now is now is now is the most important <laughs> part of the schedule. Where we got refreshments up on the fifth floor. Um, let's try to be back here at eleven sharp. And let's see.